to the What Bitcoin Did podcast. Hello there from Bedford. How are you all? I'm back from New York now, back from Consensus. So welcome to the What Bitcoin Did podcast, which is brought to you by Kraken. And today I've got an interview with Jill Carlson, Alejandro Macedo and Jamal Montessa from the Open Money Initiative about the reality of life in Venezuela and how Bitcoin can help. But before that, I've got a message from my show sponsors. So Kraken, the best exchange in the world for buying and selling digital assets, the only place I use to buy and sell Bitcoin now. And with all the exchange hacks and the troubles and problems with security, I know Kraken is the exchange for me. Their focus on security is utterly amazing. I can't wait to record a show with Nick Pococo, their chief security officer, discussing personal exchange security. Keep an eye out for that. But they support simple buying for new traders, and they've got advanced tools for those more experienced traders out there, including margin and futures trading. They've got no high minimum and hidden fees, Kraken rewards you for trading so you can make more trades for less. So join me in supporting Kraken, the best crypto exchange in the world, by heading over to kraken.com, which is K-R-A-K-E-N.com. That is kraken.com, which is K-R-A-K-E-N.com. So BlockFi, they are creating the future of Bitcoin financial services, and they've currently got two products available. Have any of you checked them out? Always love hearing from you if you have. Let me know. Firstly, you can earn interest on your crypto with the interest accounts. I'm doing this. I've got 20% of my Bitcoin in with them. Definitely recommend you do your own research if you're interested in this. And you can also borrow against your crypto with their crypto back loans. And they've got a whole bunch of new stuff coming up. I caught up with them in New York, talked about the future for BlockFi. They extended their sponsorship and they've got loads of interesting things coming up. So I can't wait to tell you about that. But if you are interested in trying out their interest accounts or crypto back loans, then head over to BlockFi.com, which is B-L-O-C-K-F-I.com. That is BlockFi.com, which is B-L-O-C-K-F-I.com. Okay, so on to my interview with Jill, Alejandro and Jamal, and this is a show I've wanted to pull together for a long time as I've been well aware of the work they've been doing in the background. And I've also covered Venezuela a couple of times on the show, both times including Alejandro, and those are available in the show notes if you want to check them out. But I wanted to record with the team because I've often felt this uncomfortable position where I've been excited about a real use case for Bitcoin in Venezuela versus the reality of that there are people living there under abject poverty, under under the most terrible situation. And Jill has been great at tempering people's thoughts with this. You just follow her on Twitter and see some of her posts about this. But there is also another great article on Coindesk, which I would also recommend reading. It's by one of my fave journalists, Lee Quinn, and that is also available in the show notes. So Jill and Alejandro brought Jamal in from IDO into the team to help them with the design process and understand the, the reality of life for citizens in Venezuela before they could even think about how crypto and tech could help people there, which I think is super important. The amount of time and amount of research they've put into the reality of life, the reality of money, how people are using money, really is testament to them being able to present ideas and, and better ways for people to be able to cope and survive within Venezuela. So this was super interesting. We talked about their research, we talked about why Bitcoin is important, but the reality of money within the country, whether it is Bitcoin or the Bolivar, the Peso, or the different variations of the dollar that people use. Again, that was super interesting in that five twenty dollar bills is worth more than a $100 bill. But you'll hear about this in the interview. You'll make sense when you hear about it. But yeah, super interesting. Really appreciate the team coming and meeting me in New York and doing this. And if you've got any questions about the show, do feel free to reach out to me. Also, just some notes. I've got a few events I want to tell you about. On Sunday, I'm going to be heading to the Oslo Freedom Forum as a guest of Alex Gladstein. And on May the 27th, I'll be hosting a conversation about Bitcoin adoption around the world. I'll be exploring global trends in places like China, the Philippines, India, Iran, and Nigeria with Hong Kong Bitcoin Association President Leo Weiss, Bluemex Org founder Louis Buenaventura, Mechanism Labs co-founder Apana Krishnan and Bycoin CEO Timmy Ajiboy. If I've got any of those names wrong, I really apologize. But anyway, this session is in partnership with their friends at Local Bitcoins. If you fancy heading to the Freedom Forum, just visit oslofreedomforum.com. And if you want to grab a ticket today, you can use a discount code of what Bitcoin did to get 25% off your ticket price. Also, the following weekend, I'm going to be heading to Munich for the Lightning Hack Day. And I'll also be hosting a panel at the Voice of Bitcoin conference. And on Wednesday, the June the 12th, I'll be emceeing the Crypto Compare Summit in London. So more information on those coming soon. Hopefully lots of interviews to record and 
opportunity to meet some new people. And listen, if you're enjoying the podcast, you want to support the show, head over to my website, whatbitcoindid.com. Click on the support section. That'll explain everything you can do. And I do have to say a big thank you to my top tier patron, Rise Wallet, Met Them Out in New York. They are a new way into Bitcoin. No signups. You just scan a card and you're holding Bitcoin. To find out more, head over to risewallet.com. Okay, on to the interview. Sorry for the long intro. Just lots of things to update you on. If you've got any questions, then feel free to reach out to me. My email address is hello at whatbitcoindid.com. Welcome back on the show, Jill. Welcome back, Alejandro. This is your third appearance. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. And welcome to the show, finally. Do you want to like, introduce yourself as what you, you're part of this? Because people will know Jill and Alejandro, but you've not been on my show before. Sure. So my name is Jamal. Um, my background is design and engineering, and I spent the last few years uh, working at a company called IDEO, which is a global design and innovation firm, um, where I spent time working with Fortune 500 companies, helping them figure out what they should design in the future. Um, and uh, and then I met these two in the fall of 2018, and um, I'd sort of stayed out of the Bitcoin space. I had a pseudonymous Twitter account. That's how I engaged with the crypto world since around 2012, 2013. And then um, I, I never felt like it was a place for design um, the way I wanted to play a part in design. And, and these two had an interesting sort of lens and project. And I teamed up with them and we founded the Open Money Initiative in the fall. And Jill, you've been very careful to try and let people realize that Venezuela isn't the amazing, exciting opportunity for crypto that people make it out to be all the time. Because I think Bitcoin is sometimes, and I've been guilty of getting a bit excited about this, right? Yeah, I mean, there's just, there's so much nuance in the situation. And there's so much nuance in any situation that, frankly, it doesn't make for great marketing in either direction. And so I find myself when I'm talking to people about this project, about the Open Money Initiative, or just about sort of cryptocurrency in general, I find that I'm just dragging people in one direction or the other. If I'm talking to sort of the crypto native people who want Venezuela to be this incredible use case for Bitcoin, I'm dragging them back into the reality of like, no, it's not, it's not saving people. It's not pulling the population out of poverty. Like it is useful in certain scenarios, but you know, it's not that sort of dream case you want it to be. But then on the flip side, whenever I talk to basically anybody else about this, I'm dragging them in the other direction of like, no, there actually is some utility here. Like there are some people who are using Bitcoin to survive, you know, it's not widespread. And so it's just trying to capture that nuance, I think. That's a lot of what we're trying to do. Okay, so we're going to cover your research and uh, the work you guys are doing as well and kind of the future. But Alejandro, you've been on the show twice now. Firstly, to explain the history of Venezuela, which was really useful to everybody to understand the, the relationships between different countries such as Cuba and the families that have had a, like a, a stronghold over the history of Venezuela. And then you came on recently for an update. Um, can you just update us on what's happening in Venezuela right now? Because it'd be good to hear about that because obviously there's been some kind of political maneuvering recently? Yeah, so uh, recently, so on April 30th, there was uh, an attempt at an uprising against uh, the government of Maduro. And uh, what was shocking about it was that the head of the secret police was in on it, which no one thought about. Because like secret police has had a history of torturing dissidents and very, very close to Maduro and the Cubans. So this came as a complete shock. And uh, Leopoldo Lopez was the top, like, top profile political prisoner uh, he was being custodied by the secret police and the, he was released. And now uh, on that day, there was a lot of confusion. We don't really know what went down. There are some rumors that the Minister of Defense was like top military guy and uh, the head of the Supreme Court were planning to just tell Maduro this, it's time to go. And uh, they were negotiating a transition. But uh, the deal didn't happen. It fell through. And... Uh, for some reason, we're stuck in this uh, situation where Leopoldo Lopez is now in an embassy. Like may, there are many people who have been either imprisoned by the new head of Sabin, which which is uh, used to be the the one who instituted torture. Uh, in I think it was in 2017 that he came into the institution. So they are doing a reshuffle and they're doing like an Erdogan style wipeout uh, and and purge so that they can regain control. But the government looks very weak right now. So we don't know what's going to happen um, because the uprising, the, the one that started on April 30th kind of failed. 
but hopefully there will be another attempt or or some development that will uh, get rid of Maduro. Right, so it's kind of a stalemate right now. Yes, right now, yes. Okay, uh, but you feel like it's getting closer and closer? <sighs> it's really hard to tell. I, right. I, I don't want to give myself uh, false hope. Uh, I want to stay realistic. I, I do think the government looks weak right now, but I know they've come back from from war situations, perhaps. So Okay, all right. So I'm aware there's uh, a number of initiatives being run in Venezuela, and there's um, I've been contacted by a few, but I've kind of kept my distance uh, from them all because what's been quite interesting here is that you didn't jump straight in, right, Jill? You decided that you were going to step back and do a lot of research first. Can you explain, firstly, like your awareness of the initiatives that are currently in operation, what successes and failures, what you've seen that you've liked and you don't like, and then we'll start talking about why you've decided to do your research first. Yeah, so there are absolutely a lot of initiatives going on, um, many of which are super impactful. Bitcoin Venezuela on one end of the spectrum is this uh, nonprofit initiative run by a guy named Randy Brito. Um, they do a lot of good work on the ground in Venezuela. Uh, on the other end of the spectrum, you have guys like AirTM, which is a for-profit company, but is uh, one of their biggest markets is in Venezuela for the products and services that they have. So there's a lot of great work going on there, but you're right in that we decided to start with research as opposed to trying to jump into the situation. Um, for me, very personally, I mean, a lot of where that comes from is this sort of just sense of humility about the situation where, as I was mentioning before we hit record, one of the first things people ask me is they're like, it's like, are you Venezuelan? Like, you don't sound like what? And I'm like, no, 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 I'm just, I'm not Venezuelan. I'm, I'm just some gringa who happens to know a decent amount about the economics of the situation, you know, who sees, sees possibility here and who cares. But I also just think that as sort of a lesson for, um, the technology industry and the crypto industry specifically within that, I just think that you have to start from the problem that you're trying to solve and you have to start from first principles of that problem. And you can't go in with a hammer just hoping that the problem there is a nail because what if it turns out not to be? Um, and I think that very frequently, you know, in the crypto space, we have a lot of really brilliant optimizers who can take technology and make it incrementally better. Um, but I think that there's probably not enough of that sort of first principle, start with the problem work that goes on. And that was very much the approach that we wanted to take. Okay, two questions. Firstly, why nonprofit? Because I imagine fundraising is one of the challenges here. Trust me, I've thought about this. I'm yeah. Like, we should have just issued a token. <laughs> 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 oh god i wouldn't be able to live with myself yeah asking. yeah no i'm, I'm joking <laughs> then, obviously but then, like it, in moments of frustration it's like <laughs> is it a lot harder than to raise money as a non-profit you know I'll, I'll say we've been very fortunate to find alignment with a lot of uh you know big very well-funded organizations both within crypto and outside of crypto um and and that support has you know, that's, that's been our lifeblood, right? And so that has been, we've been very fortunate in that way. So it hasn't been a struggle, no, but certainly when you then look around at the sort of valuations of some of these projects and companies that have issued tokens or are for profit, you do sort of, sort of start to question it at times. But I think the reaction that Ale and Jam just had, as, as I said, the token thing, I think that that's really what it comes down to, which is like, we wouldn't have been able to live with ourselves. We wouldn't have been able to look in the mirror in the morning if we'd done something that we felt was sort of disingenuous, which if you're trying to fundraise and pretend that you're a for-profit company, when you're not even sure of what the problem is, when you're not even sure that you're going to be the right team to go and solve it, that feels disingenuous in a way that I think that we didn't want to risk what we were doing and the credibility of our project around this on that. And so we would rather go what was sort of initially maybe a tougher route. But I think now, you know, we're all kind of grateful that, that we did go that route. Anyway. And where did Jamal come into the picture with all of this? I heard him said, well, you just walked into his office one day. What was the... Yeah, we... Well, no. So I... 
Ollie and I started down this road about a year ago. Um, we teamed up with Zuko Wilcox, who was very curious about this situation as well. We did a bit of consulting work for the Zcash company on just sort of market research overall in Venezuela. Um, and we realized very quickly that, you know, this was all well and good to go and do this sort of market research. But what we really needed to do was much more around sort of design research. And when people say design, they often think just UX. What I mean when I say that is actually a much bigger issue. And the only firm, the only people I knew who had this sort of expertise were at IDEO. Um, and I was lucky enough to know Dan and Tara and some of the other folks at the IDEO team. And I got in touch with them. They were like, yeah, come on in. Um, and we literally walked into the office. And I think the first person I saw was Jamal. Uh, and we just got to talking and very quickly realized that there was a lot of alignment, both in terms of sort of interest and kind of the ideology of what we were doing, et cetera. And so, yeah, thank God we walked into that office and found him. Otherwise, I think we'd still be sort of floundering around trying to figure out what direction to go with this. But. <laughs> Jamal, can you explain what it is that you do that that helped with the project? Like, what is your background here? And All yeah. of it. He did all of it. He <laughs> did every, everything. He's the boss. Um, <clears throat> so maybe a... a uh, a good place to start is what is what IDEO does. So um, IDEO is sort of like the place where this the the the, the name human centered design or design thinking came from. They certainly didn't invent it, but they're sort of a core part of of that narrative that's now in the world. How important design is, and what they're very good at is taking a very open and messy problem and figuring out a direction, a point of view. And so companies like you know say Google come and say you know. We want to we want to create a product for these types of people. We don't even know what to do. How do we figure that out? What should we make for them? What matters to them in the world, right? And so that process that we use is a process that we used for this project, which is um, is about understanding what matters in the world to Venezuelans who are who are struggling day to day. How do they manage their money? How do they protect their financial health? How do they create resilient communities? How are they doing this stuff? What are their attitudes and behaviors? What do they believe in? And how do you take the hacks that you see, the things that people are doing to survive or thrive, and how do you productize those to make them available to more people? So th that's sort of the lens that we use for the project, where it's like, it's it, you know, we're all interested in Bitcoin, but you have to put that on hold and understand the reality first of what are people doing today? The people that are doing well, the people that aren't doing so well, and how do you bridge that gap and change the outcomes? And it's agnostic to Bitcoin being used, right? Yeah, it's, it almost feels like you're doing the work of the government. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, this is foundational research that leads to products, tools, and services that are new to the world, right? We're sort of in the, we're in the, in the process of trying to figure out a new future and figuring out this mess, this culture, this like that cu culture is just, you know, an entangled mess of ideas and narratives. Figuring that out is a core part of designing things that actually help people in a context that you have no, no understanding of, that you're not part of. Can you, give, can you give a couple of the examples maybe of the things that IDEO has worked on or been a hand in yeah, inventing? Because so right. that's really yeah. helped me okay. understand what this, so, this process is about. Oh man, where do I start? So there's, there's a lot, IDEO has been around since the 70s. Um, and the, the first Palm Pilot was designed by the first Apple Mouse. Um, the, the idea of a laptop closing the keyboard and, and the screen closing. Um, and these are sort of foundational products for, products from years ago. But IDEO has transitioned and taken that process that they, they've used to design physical products. And now it applies to services and policies and all kinds of things like that. So I think one of the really cool projects that I like of, of recent at IDEO, they, they designed a whole school system in, in Peru. Um, which is pretty remarkable. And, and IDEO sort of moved from building these discrete, tangible products to um, sort of systemic and policy-level problems. Um, and, and it's the same process of understanding what matters in the world to the people you're designing for. And that's the place they start. It's fascinating. One of the strange things is that I can see you're all genuinely excited about the work you're doing. Mm. And, but at the same time, it must be strange because I guess there's some conflicts there because you're dealing with some people in horribly desperate situations as well. 
Yeah, it's 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 challenging. It was definitely very uh, emotionally intensive work. So every single one of our interviews, you know, we did we did about uh, 17, 18 interviews in in Colombia and Venezuela, and almost every single interview there was tears running down people's cheeks. I mean, these are people who are, um, despite some many of the people we met who are not you know, living in, in abject poverty. Some of them are doing very well and some of them are doing pretty well. Some of them are not doing so good. We had the whole spectrum, but it is extraordinary the amount of risk that people take to leave their home countries if, they, if they're forced to leave because of violence, danger, safety, lack of opportunity, leaving your entire network, leaving your house behind, your car, your business, your family. Um, the risks people take, was pretty incredible, and every single interview had 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 you know tears running down people's cheeks. It was very it was very challenging. Yeah. Did you go into Venezuela, or was it all on the border? We went into Cucuta, the border town between Venezuela and Colombia, and um, is that where the bridge is? The the bridge, yeah. yeah. There are there are several bridges there. Uh, there's one that's very emblematic. That one was closed when we visited because. Um, the government decided to shut down the, the border, which they, they do sometimes. Uh, I think it's been shut down since then. Um, that was when they, like, White House team was trying to get the humanitarian aid in. Uh, yeah, unfortunately, we couldn't really travel into Venezuela because they're not uh, issuing visas for U.S. citizens, for example. And I have a passport that's expired. So if I went in, I couldn't go back. Yeah, you explained that before previously. Yeah. Um, well... I, I guess I could smuggle myself out if I really wanted to take a risk, but you know, let's let's not do let's that, not do okay. that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> thanks. <laughs> <laughs> do, do we know what percentage of the population is left Venezuela now? Um, it's about it's more than ten percent of the population. It's uh, projected to be about five million people this year. Venezuelan population is about thirty. So right now, what the, the numbers? Five percent just this year, right? Um, so or, five five million. Five million. From, let's say, I think the numbers that they, this is tricky because uh, there are different sources for the numbers, right? But I think that it's from 2017 to today, which has been like the this wave of migration. People talk about migration waves. Uh, it's about um, around 5 million total uh, that have been leaving. And before that, it wasn't really... I mean, it was in the order of hundreds of thousands, maybe one million, right? In like before, like in 2011, 2014, we were talking about a million people, maybe two million. But now that has grown to five or so. Or like the projection is five. I think the latest numbers, but these are delayed numbers because like it, it takes yeah. a while to to gather the data. It's about that that much. So. so one of the things I've thought about a few times with regards to Venezuela, and it would be good to hear your perspectives on this or what you found, but... When I've seen the issues raised on the news, because it's covered quite a bit on the news these days, in my head I'm thinking, right, this is a country of millions of people. There's going to be hundreds of thousands of businesses, for shops, marketplaces, banks, huge companies, investment, all different kinds of companies like any other country. But essentially as the money's become useless, I can't understand how everything hasn't just completely collapsed. Hmm. Yeah. Oh, so we, we went into the research just thinking – that um, you know, like just wondering why why hasn't why haven't things collapsed? Why so like one of the things we found is that the Bolivar is still very necessary for everyday commerce, which is very surprising. I thought that we would see a dollarization, you know, uh, kind of like what we saw in Zimbabwe in two thousand eight two thousand nine. But then again, we weren't there in Zimbabwe, so we don't we don't know how like at least uh, majority of people who haven't lived through it, they don't know what time lap, like what, what timeline uh, the, these kind of phenomenons have. And while we have seen a surge in the use of Colombian peso near the border, we have seen a surge of dollars in cash, especially during the blackout, there was a lot of use of dollar, dollars cash. Because as, as we mentioned earlier, people, the only thing that people can really pay with cash is maybe some uh, legumes, some like some uh, vegetables and uh, some like the public transportation because like there's no there's no electronic uh electronic transfers or or debit cards are too slow for for that kind of thing that people don't have access to that in 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 buses but um that has become you know people have had to transact more with uh with electronic uh it's um it's really kind of mind-boggling to to wonder why uh things haven't really uh collapsed entirely 
uh, there's this inertia, right? There's, uh, sorry, there's, um, you know, the Bolivar is the most widespread currency. So it's, it's the asset that most people have. And so if you want to transact with other people, you need to use something that they already, like that the economy is flowing in, in the economy. So the, that is, it seems to be gradually gravitating towards the US dollar, but uh, it hasn't fully uh, happened, this transition. I, I, I wanted to say that, you know, in a lot of ways, you could say the economy has totally collapsed. But there's almost like two economies, right? There's like, you know, we, we, you know, one of the things that surprised us was that there's this extreme food scarcity, but restaurants are full, right? Yeah, and, I heard Jules talk about this yesterday. And so there's, in, in some ways, there's two economies where it's like you have this extreme scarcity of not only food, it's medicine, female hygiene products, anything you can imagine is just extremely hard to find, but then you have people who happen to have access to, say, a U.S. dollar bank account, or they're connected with the government, and they still have this, um, it's almost like a shadow economy, right? And, and almost the, the, both sides of the economy are a shadow economy, right? Every, every transaction kind of has, feels like a drug deal, because it's virtually illegal, right? It's like there are, there are product quotas, um, price fixing, all of that stuff that Basically, people are not abiding by because if they did abide by it, they wouldn't be able, as a business, to say make money. You you know you'd go to business immediately. So you have you you basically have two economies. One is like in shambles, um, and then one is still running, where people are you know bulletproofing their cars for twenty five thousand dollars and you know initiating a U.S. dollar bank transfer to pay for that. Right. Right. Okay. One thing that would be helpful, I think, for some people is to properly understand inflation and. Joe, I think you'll be great at explaining this. So, like, we hear about a million percent inflation, but trying to understand what that means is, is quite hard. So, firstly, could you quantify that? Could you also explain how an economy gets to the point where it hits such ridiculous levels of inflation? And are there examples of countries who've managed to kind of reverse this? Yeah, so inflation is a very ugly beast. Um, but inflation is also actually, in many ways, necessary for economic growth. Um, so in the United States, we run at about 2% inflation annually, and that is considered actually quite healthy. Uh, now I know some of the Bitcoin maximalists listening to this are cringing, um, but you know, per sort of general accepted economic truth, that, that is reality. 2% is roughly fine. If we dip much below 2%, actually things can start to slow down. The economy can start to slow down. Growth starts to slow down. People don't want to spend their money as much. And as spending drops, obviously, economic growth can also take a hit. Now, if you go much above 2%, so people will start to talk about inflation fears, if we get up to like 3 4 or 5% inflation, that becomes a bit scary because then suddenly the US dollar or whatever currency it is, it's losing value at a rate that's hard to keep up with, with your own spending and with your own, with the economic growth that's happening in the overall economy. Now, we complain about two and a half or three percent inflation, right, in the United States and most other uh, sort of developed countries. Now, again, in Venezuela, they've already surpassed a million percent inflation, and it's now projected that we'll be at 10 million percent inflation. And so you hear about all different sorts of ways of quantifying this of, you know, if you had a million dollars five years ago, then you're left with just a handful of dollars today. We talked to one woman in particular who told us how when she left Venezuela, when she emigrated to go to Colombia, she took her life savings with her. But when she went to convert, she went, she wound up with about $3,000. This is her life savings. She was a fairly well off woman in Venezuela and her life savings amounted to $3,000. And as Jamal mentioned, that was the point in the conversation where sort of eyes started to well up um, and tears started to come because she was talking about, you know, this is this was the money that I was going to use to send my kids to university and it's amounted to $3,000 now here today. Um, the, the other image that I find very helpful just in trying to conceive of what this even means is that if you're a shopkeeper in Venezuela, you're not going around just daily and changing the prices on your goods. You have to go around by the hour. You can't go around fast enough and change all of the prices in your store to keep up with inflation. It's as though your money is just melting in front of you. Um, and so, so does that, that 
picture actually happen where people talk about people going around the store and repricing constantly? So more or less, um, one of the dynamics in Venezuela, and I'm sure we'll get into this further, is that it's mandated that you use the boulevard. And so it's very difficult for you to advertise prices in U.S. dollars or in Colombian pesos or indeed in Bitcoin or anything else that we might think people want to use. Because if a government official comes around or police or the National Guard, they can choose to enforce that. And what they'll probably do is they'll fine you and then just use that to line their own pockets. Um, so you don't want to put prices up in U.S. dollars. And so it tends to be the, the case where th there is actually just this understanding between the merchant, the shopkeeper, and the potential customer that the price that's up is not still good. And you have to come up to the register and basically find out what the new price is. Um, interestingly, though, then we would talk to these shopkeepers and they would then go into the back room and get out their books and show us that they were doing all of their accounting in U.S. dollars because that was the only way that they could still make sense of it. People tend to think in U.S. dollars, but they still list the prices in boulevards. Yeah, because one of the things I was trying to imagine is if they keep repricing every hour, once they've sold the goods, they then the money's they've got to spend it quickly because it becomes immediately useless. Yeah, yeah, no, exactly. Um, so we touched on this concept of the hot potato, right? Yeah. Where it's like as soon as it lands in your lap, you've got to pass it on. But critically, as with hot potato, like you've got to catch the potato at some point to still be in the game, right? Like no one wants to be the person sitting in the circle who never gets past the potato. You need the boulevard to survive. But as soon as you have it, you've got to spend it as quickly as you can, either to get it into some other currency, if you can find some who has access to that which is still quite scarce or you've got to spend it on a good that is not going to go bad so we've heard stories anecdotes of people actually using things like eggs to store their value because that's one thing they can still get and if they go out and spend the boulevards that they as the merchant or whoever it is has received then you know it, the eggs are going to store the value better better than that one of our participants had this poignant analogy where he's like you got to tie your donkey you got to tie your donkey or your donkey's going to run away. And so he, he's, he's referring to, um, um, you know, getting paid. And you get paid, and if you don't tie your donkey, meaning convert your boulevard to a better store of value, your donkey runs away and your profit's gone. How does a country go from, say, 2% inflation, maybe even like, you know, you can get to like 10%. That, that's obviously not great. How, does it, how do you actually get to a million percent? How is the exchange rate tracked? And how do you actually know it's a million percent? Like, I'm trying to understand in my mind how this is actually happening in reality. Yeah, so there's a whole host of reasons why countries go through this. Um, in the case of Venezuela, it's largely due to the fact that it was a socialist, socialist economy. Um, it was an economy, it is an economy that was largely reliant on oil, and the price of oil dropped. And so suddenly you have this combination of socialist policies that are promising certain things to people. Um, and the coffer is starting to run dry. And so you, what can you do in that situation? You can either change your policies, which is politically very challenging, um, or you can start to print money. And I'm happy to let Ale speak a little bit more to that. Um, but just, you know, in terms of how you get from point A to point B, it, it can happen shockingly rapidly, as has happened in Venezuela. Yeah, so we spoke with um, Frank Musi from the Harvard uh, Growth Lab, um, and uh, he had this um, way of looking at the situation that I thought was very interesting and very accurate. I think what what happened was that for years, the policy people at the government, they were told that if they printed money and if they had these policies of price fixing and uh, just like closing off the economy and having these exchange control they would face consequences, right? But like this was like in the 2008, 2009 period where Chavez was still around and the price of oil was booming. So they continuously listened to experts that told them, hey, you know, like this is going to happen, this is going to happen, this is going to happen. And since they faced no consequences, they just disregarded everything. So they kept the same policies and they didn't realize when the price of oil came down that they couldn't keep running those policies. And by then they were stuck because of, you know, they, they wanted to keep keep them for political reasons and they just like thought they were invincible. So when things started going badly, uh, they they just couldn't react and, and they don't know how to react anymore. 
Wow, okay. All right, so let's get into the research. Um, can you just start by explaining me, to me what is the average day like for somebody in Venezuela now? And I expect there's probably different examples here, different people, because you've talked about a two-tier economy. But give me the, the most common examples of a, a standard life. So uh, we spoke with a variety of people. We wanted to seek extremes, right? We wanted to, for example, we, we talked with a um, student uh, in Caracas who was a 22-year-old doing an internship, uh, was finishing her career, her like her major, and uh, she was using Bitcoin. Uh, she was mining Bitcoin uh, in her house, and that uh, income had supplanted the entire family's income because her father uh, lost her, his job and uh, her mother was working as a teacher, but obviously not making enough. So it turned out that she uh, had the she, she had the miners running in, in the basement and she also was using she was renting out space to other people who were mining and charging like 15 percent. So that income uh, was it became the family's income and, and she whenever she needed to. Uh, use the money she went into local bitcoins and she used some of the money that she had in in her, in her miners and uh, traded it for bolivar so and and deposited it directly in her mother's account so she could do the shopping so we spoke people with with people that had that kind of profile you know the the bitcoin user and we also had talked with people that were not at all interested or not not even aware of what bitcoin was people actually a lot of people associated Bitcoin with the Petro and therefore with scams or things that don't work. So um, I think on on average, like you asked me about like the average person, uh, I, if, if I had to like pick a point, I would say the average person doesn't know about Bitcoin or doesn't doesn't uh, or, or or has heard of it at least. I, I think most people have heard of it, but they think it's a scam or they think that it's it is something that doesn't apply to them that doesn't work. The higher level thing that I would point out here is there's certainly no average Venezuelan, as you point out, like, you know, there's this huge inequality and disparity of just sort of what day to day life looks like for a given person. But there's also no average day in Venezuela, because one of the big sort of takeaways of our research is that I kind of went in hoping that, okay, you know, if we find like a handful of these hacks that people are using, then people will be able to use those hacks repeatedly. But in fact, people have to repeatedly reinvent the ways that they're surviving and the hacks that they're using. And that's because the conditions are changing so quickly. And every day you wake up and you don't know what fresh hell you're going to find. Is it going to be the power is out today? Is it going to be, okay, the power is back on, but the internet is out? Is it going to be that, you know, the National Guard has come to your local shop and enforced something and that's going to cause some shortage that's localized to you in your area? You just don't know every single day you wake up what's going to be happening then. I was going to add one, one other thing is that, you know, it's a pretty dire situation, but there's also a lot of resilience we saw in the face of all this. I mean, people are banding together, right? It's like one of the interesting things that we saw was that these networks of people are replacing sort of like traditionally static government and stores, right? So if you want to procure goods, you go to your WhatsApp group, you go to your family, um, and that's how you find, say, milk powder or something else that you're looking for. Um, people are also starting to work second jobs, right? Because the income from their primary profession doesn't pay enough because it doesn't get adjusted for inflation. So we, we met a professor of immunology, actually, who um, is, is writing papers for students in foreign countries on the internet, um, despite her expertise and her PhD, um, because she can't make enough money from her professorship. Um, and this is very common, is that the, the traditional jobs that people had aren't paying enough, so they take on second jobs. You know, people don't go to stores to buy stuff. They go to their networks. So has the, the gig economy been very helpful to people in Venezuela, or is it still niche? Not in the sense of gig economy, you know. In, Not in the in, sense of, like, Uber <laughs> travel. Yeah. No, yeah. but I mean, like, online yeah. services. Yeah, I, I, and... I, think, I think absolutely. I think that it's important to point out, though, that while... Things like this are in many ways a lifeline. It's in no way a sort of a, a, an optimal situation, right? Like this professor, it, it kind of broke my heart as she was talking about it, right? She's 
helping kids in the United States and Panama write these papers, like undergrads, right? And she's, you know, a tenured professor. She's like, yeah, all I really want to be doing is my own research, but instead I'm helping these kids online. Um, she also actually had a Bitcoin miner set up, but she emphasized to us, she was like, you know, I don't really care about Bitcoin. Like, I'm not I'm not interested in this. It's just, it's something that I can do in order to make a bit more money. But I would much rather be spending the time that I'm spending maintaining this ASIC on my research. This isn't like a passion project for me. So. I think it's helpful to also realize what happened in Cuba also when, you know, uh, the government instituted these policies like it, the, the Cuban government and the Venezuelan government are very close ideologically. And so in, in, in results of like their, their policies as well. So a lot of like in, in Cuba to survive, uh, you need to have access to foreign currency. So like they invented this like convertible peso that has some uh, matching with the dollar. So if you want to have a family in Cuba and you want to have a life, you need some kind of access. So like if you work at a hotel, if you have access to the tourism industry, which is big in Cuba, if you can work as a taxi driver, uh, or if you can dabble in goods and resell goods, that's the only way that you can make it work. And Venezuela is increasingly becoming that. You need either to have a service that is valuable, you can be a driver for foreign diplomats or, or people who are doing business in Caracas. You can either be reselling goods uh, that are scarce and, and therefore your savings are in goods, you can either like be a money changer and and use maybe your network in the United States and Colombia to make it make it work and and make a living in foreign currency and you you keep your savings there. But you need some kind of access to the outside economy in order to really survive, um, increasingly so. So, how much real poverty is there now in Venezuela that people actually just cannot? work because there's no work for them and cannot feed themselves or their family. How desperate is the situation? How widespread? Very. Um, I think the latest estimates are about 90, 94% poverty. And this is the reason why we're seeing this like massive wave of migration. This is the, the, the reason why people are leaving. And uh, while it's still like you would think, oh, only 10% have, has left, but you know, it's, it's still a massive amount. Like it's, we're talking millions of people, we're talking about uh, a crisis uh, about the size of the Syrian refugee crisis. And uh, it's usually people, that, the strongest people in the family that leave. So like it's, it's very widespread. It's not, not just like one segment of the population is leaving. Every, every family has someone that has left and is trying to send money home. Oh, almost like uh, going away to represent the family. Yes, to represent and to, to be able yeah. to, to, to really get some money for the family. Like, like, it's, like it's just said now, you need some kind of access to the outside world in order to make it work. And so like, like Cubans have relatives in Miami that send them money. Uh, it's, Venezuela is increasingly becoming bad. And this is why the government has also been trying to capture remittances that people are sending. I think it's worth just emphasizing that point that when we say you can't move money in or out of the country... That's very literal, right? Western Union, and Western Union, I mean, kind of sucks, right? Like it kind of rent seeking, you have to pay for high fees. But even something like Western Union, it just doesn't exist in Venezuela. There's no way to transfer money in a sort of legitimate or in the sort of main economy. It's all running through this underground economic system. Uh, and very frequently what will happen is if you are, if you went to Colombia, say, if you're the breadwinner of your family, you went to Colombia and you're trying to transfer money back home to Venezuela, you have to find a money changer who's banked in both Colombia and in Venezuela. And that money changer will accept your Colombian pesos. And then through her or his Colum Venezuelan bank account, excuse me, uh, transfer the equivalent in boulevards to your family. And so it's always this very convoluted, you're doing two moves within two systems to get money in or out of the country. Just, just as you can imagine, a real mess. And because this is happening in a sort of underground economic way, you know, I want to emphasize often these transactions go just fine, but there is this huge element of risk associated with it because if something goes wrong, if your money changer scams you or exit scams you, then you have no recourse. 
I also heard you talk in your talk yesterday. You mentioned that uh, access to kind of basics is really limited. And so, for example, it's very hard for women to get hold of, say, tampons. Like, what is the real reality of this? And what is the impact on these women? Yeah, no, I mean, it's it's that. Uh, one of our associates, James, who did fantastic research with us while, while we were on the ground there in the field, he spoke with some women who had recently come over the border from Venezuela to Colombia. And he said that the moment in that conversation that stood out to him the most was when a few of them broke down into tears because they were so relieved. They were telling him they were so relieved to be able to get across the border and find tampons and feminine hygiene products again. Um, but it's not just that. It's, you know, the, the sort of meme that people point to, but it's actually a harsh reality is even toilet paper, right? And so you'll see these sort of memes or cartoons. Venezuelans have fantastic senses of humor, thank God. But you'll see these cartoons of Maduro, the president, like holding up toilet paper because there's such toilet paper scarcity there. And just... Take a minute if you're listening to this and just try to imagine going through a day without toilet paper. And we're not talking about like just the like very, very low, like absolute destitute ranks of society. This is like lawyers, doctors, bankers don't have access to these products. And also no running water and also flaky electricity and very slow Internet. So not only... Like access to product is a big thing. It's a, it's a big part of why we are so screwed. But lately, it's also the services. You you can't just can't rely on service. So like sometimes people don't go to work because they need to take care of a kid or they they need to like wait until the electricity comes on to do something that's important or you have to flush the toilets or you know you you, you got to do stuff that if the environment keeps changing you can't predict what you're going to do and so it's not not only about being able to predict the price like it's not only about the economy like oh what what price do i use to to like for for to, how, how much do i charge for this particular product and how much is it going to cost me to replace it but also time management you have to like figure out how much time things are going to like things are going to take you and it's impossible to to estimate in some some cases Next up, I talked to Jill, Alejandro, and Jamal more about what is happening in Venezuela and how Bitcoin might help. But before that, I've got a message from my show sponsors. So firstly, I'm going to talk to you about Dropbit, the best Bitcoin wallet I've ever used. Yeah, you know, the team, when I first met them, they said it's like a Venmo for Bitcoin. And look, we don't have Venmo here, but I've seen people use it when I've been out in the States. So essentially, when I travel, Bitcoin becomes my Venmo. When I was out in New York, I actually used my Dropbit wallet to pay people a couple of times. And it was super cool. It's so useful. It's so easy to use. And also, it's changed the way I use Bitcoin. Whenever I've traveled previously, I've always taken a hardware wallet with me. I don't know why. I just never got to start using a mobile wallet. But this time, when I headed out to New York, I just took my Dropbit wallet. I loaded it up with Bitcoin, and I had whatever I needed for the whole trip. So that was pretty cool. Yeah, you definitely got to check it out. The UX is amazing. It's so easy to use. You can even text Bitcoin to your friends with a phone number. So definitely go check that out. It's available for iPhone and Android. Just head over to dropbit.app to find out more. That is D-R-O-P-B-I-T dot app. That is dropbit.app, which is D-R-O-P-B-I-T dot app. Also, my other new advertiser, Aurox, for the hardcore traders out there, the world's best crypto trading terminal, which is available on both Mac and PC. Have you checked it out yet? Have you downloaded it? I have. And look, I'm not a trader anymore. I don't actively trade. But I wanted to try it out. I wanted to take a look at it. I downloaded it. It was super easy. I did set up my BTC USD chart for Kraken to check the price because I do buy and sell on Kraken these days. And they've got a whole bunch of amazing features. Using your API keys, you can trade up to nine exchanges, including Kraken. You can create advanced order types directly in the software. There is a trade feed created from the best professionals to help you with your research. You can set up alerts from over 150 indicators, and you can even create your own custom indicators written in PineScript or JavaScript. Definitely for your hardcore traders out there. I'm sure you'll love it. For a 14-day trial, head over to getorox.com, which is G-E-T-A-U-R-O-X.com. That is getorox.com, which is G-E-T-A-U-R-O-X.com. And lastly, BlockFi. 
as I mentioned, I caught up with the team in New York. They've extended their sponsorship again, which is amazing. That's four times now. They've been a long-term supporter of the podcast, and I'm a long-term fan of them. I'm actually going to be looking at producing some shows soon, looking at real use case of Bitcoin. Where are the real uses outside of speculation and trading? And yeah, they'll form part of this. So they've got two products available now. If you want to try them out, they've got their interest accounts where you can earn interest on your Bitcoin and your Ethereum. I'm using it. I'm using it for my Bitcoin. I've got 20% in there. If you do check it out, please do your own research. Also, check out the interview I did with Zach Prince answering all the questions that listeners have about the product. That's available on my SoundCloud. They also have their crypto back loans. If you want to find out more about either of these products, head over to BlockFi.com, which is B-L-O-C-K-F-I.com. That is BlockFi.com, which is B-L-O-C-K-F-I.com. How much exploitation is going on within the country? And I I mean, exploitation in terms of people scamming people. You mentioned potentially the money transmitter scamming, but also maybe exploitation of women and children in ways that are probably really sad and desperate. We we saw a lot of that in Cucuta. Uh, Cucuta is a very, it, it has always been a complicated place because border towns usually are very fast paced, dynamic and, and very, strange in some ways we we saw a significant number of women who were offering you know the issues they, they were uh, they were offering prostitution services uh and uh they were charging something like seven thousand pesos which is less than three dollars and obviously you know like many of them looked underage many of them looked destitute and uh they are just competing in this market they're offering whatever that it is that they they think they have or they have to be able to survive and uh, I mean it wouldn't surprise me that in in Venezuela in Caracas for example there would be women also doing this to to survive because as, as Jill and Jamal mentioned earlier there's kind of like two economies right like there's the very rich and the well connected and the people who are in ties with government they still have access to dollars and 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 access to products so I, I can imagine that a lot of that is going on in in the cities of Venezuela as well and um, it may also be mentioned worth mentioning that you know the dire situation is you know a situation that even the police officers are facing the people who are supposed to enforce the law in Venezuela right the people you rely on for your safety when things go wrong aren't there because they're also desperate and they're also taking extreme measures and breaking the law and so you know in moments where the power goes out, we would hear stories about like, you know, everyone's inside because everyone's too scared to go outside and they're hearing gunshots and people yelling outside. Um, there is a lot of stories of, of violence and, and in a lot of ways we kind of came away feeling like there's this sense of it almost feeling like, um, like Lord of the Flies um, and, and, and this PTSD that people must have and must be experiencing is not it's not trivial. It's a it's a very real thing, and it's compounded on top of the extreme scarcity of, you know, very basic products. As people are feeling this um, fear of just being outside. Yeah, anarchy isn't pretty. <laughs> isn't actually pretty. Yeah. What about the positives? Were there things that you saw that kind of raised your hopes? Are there things that you saw that kind of were it would put a smile on your face or see any kind of potential positive future? Yeah, I mean, one thing that that I really came away from it with and that I want to emphasize to people is that while, yes, on the one hand, it's Lord of the Flies, it's Mad Max, it's it's this really ugly state of anarchy. On the other hand, there are still systems within that that are working and functioning really well. And those are often, of course, family units working together, groups of friends, uh, even like alumni networks of universities collaborating to be able to source good source medicine for each other. Um, there are so many stories of, you know, Oh, my neighbor comes over every day and checks on me and brings me bits of food. And, you know, then I'll watch, I'll watch his kids in return and, and things like this of just this real collaboration and this real trust that it takes in order to survive. And in some ways, in some cases, in many ways, continue to, to live a normal sort of existence or something resembling a normal existence in very not normal, very extreme scenarios. So 
there there is hope as well. And I mentioned this already, but just the sort of sense of humor that people have. You know, there were certainly tears in every interview, but generally there was also real genuine laughter as well. Yeah, and maybe I want to emphasize as well the role that digital networks have in in all of this. Like Jill mentioned, you know, th these are obviously the, the most salient aspect for us because we're doing human-centered research is people caring for each other and, and touching each other, seeing each other uh, at a human level, but also the fact that WhatsApp exists and that it's still operating in Venezuela normally. Uh, you know, WhatsApp doesn't take a lot of bandwidth to operate. Like you can send messages, you can send voice notes. And that connection that people still have with, I mentioned, uh, their family members who, who left, uh, that ability to communicate is very, very important for resiliency and for having the, the groups kind of scale a little bit. But that also carries risks, like we mentioned, if you're if you're transacting like if you, if you and especially when it comes to money like if you are um, part of an alumni network and you have a money changer there that helps you out uh, that might be okay but if you go to a broader uh, like a facebook group that has composition of people that you may not know about and you're desperate and you will need to send money right away you trust one of these people and these people might exit scam you um this is something that we have to contend with like people are in a situation where not everyone has the connections that they need to get access to the product or the money that they that they have, we need to invent systems that leverage the trust that people have in each other and, and elevate it in a way that they feel empowered to not only communicate with each other, but also be able to transact safely with each other. Okay, wow, okay. That's a lot, it's a lot to take in. It's, uh, it's a lot to take in, yeah. No, I we felt this way. You mentioned earlier the sort of dissonance between, you know, we're talking to people experiencing this tragedy, we're very enthusiastic about trying to help, trying to serve the situation. And, you know, I want to mention, like, it, for the listeners of this, for you, Peter, like, it is a lot to take in. And there were so many moments throughout this process where we we're just kind of like, whoa, okay, I need to just sort of take a step back and digest, like, take a second with it. Okay, so let's go back. What you said to me earlier, Jill, was that you had to find out what the problem is, and I'm sure the pro there's multiple problems. But how did Definitely. you just? What did you distill the problems down into? So, as you as you say, there are a lot of different problems here to solve, um, and the important thing is actually I've discovered sort of through the process of doing this sort of design research process. It would be so nice to think that it's as simple as coming away with just sort of a handful of questions that we can then go back and answer. But really what we've come away with are these insights, these sort of nuggets of, okay, what does it take to survive today? What are the hacks that people are using today? Um, and how can we think about adapting those or scaling those or making those accessible to even more people? And then also the design principles that we would have to bring to this. Um, and so I'll give just, just one example to give sort of a semblance of this, which is one insight that's really stood out to me is that a lot of the problems that people are facing are really about having access to these different financial silos. And so folks in Venezuela, they tend to be banked at about seven or eight different banks just within the country. And the reason for this is the following. As we mentioned, most of the economy runs on bank transfer. And so if you get up to the cash register at a merchant, it's not actually a cash register in most cases. In most cases, it's the merchant giving you their bank information so that you can make the bank transfer. Now, if you don't happen to be banked at the same bank as the merchant, then you can't do that transaction. You have to maybe turn around to the guy behind you in line and say, hey, are you banked at both my bank and his bank? And can I send it to you? And can you send it to him? And, you know, we'll do this multiple hops thing. But this, I mean, it's it's fractal almost. That's that's sounds, sort of- the, Sounds a little bit like the, the Lightning Network. Yeah, it, it, it actually is. <laughs> yeah. yeah, completely. And this is kind of where I'm going with it, wow. actually, is that you find this all the time, whether it's, Within the country, people using these multiple hops to get to what they need and to be able to do an exchange, whether it's on a more macro scale, trying to do these transactions or trying to send money in or out of the country. Again, you're using a money changer who, yeah, if you will, has channels open in both Colombia and Venezuela and maybe the United States. Um, 
And so that was kind of a real nugget of insight to me there where, you know, I can then think about inspiration, whether it's within crypto with something like the Lightning Network, um, or whether it's even outside of crypto with just these different being able to abstract across these different silos, a bit like what actually AirTM is working on. But then the even bigger question is, okay, what is the actual human experience of that like? And what through what lens do we then need to think about building this product and for whom? Because it's going to look very different if you're building it from the merchant's perspective who's trying to receive, from the customer who's waiting in line, or from the woman or man who's in Colombia trying to send money back to her or his family. So, I can't help but think, though, you know, we've talked earlier about a lot of people see this as a great opportunity for Bitcoin. And I, I kind of get the sense of why people would think that. Because if everybody had a mobile phone with an app with the ability to just send money back and forth to each other, that would make a life a lot easier. But I can't help but think then something like Bitcoin it's still not great because it is so volatile and perhaps some form of dollar stable coin would be much better for people and almost some form of Venmo style relationship that people have with each other. Yeah, so what we, we thought the same. We thought that, you know, people, what they tell us they want is the dollar. Uh, but if you think about it, what is the dollar? Like what, when you have dollars in your bank account in the US, that is a dollar. But also if you have a dollar in cash, that's also a dollar. And if you have RTM dollars, that's also a dollar. And PayPal dollars, it's also like the dollar doesn't exist. There's a lot of different representations of the same thing. And they are siloed, right? Like people, some people have access to PayPal. Some people have access to a bank account in the US. And they, these things, they don't, they don't represent the same thing. They, they are, they trade differently. So like if you, if you want to sell your PayPal dollars in Venezuela, you get less money. You get less bolivars than if you you would get uh, if you would sell your Zelle dollars. Your or Zelle. even even five twenty dollar bills are actually more valuable than a single hundred dollar bill in Venezuela because if you want to go and spend your hundred dollar bill, you can't get change back. You can't get change in dollars, and so it's more likely that you'll be able to spend the twenty dollar bill in one go. And yeah, just to your point, there are all of these sort of differentiations between the medium of what you're using in addition to just the asset. Right. And then so what we found is that liquidity and like the, the convertibility of the of the money and and using something that people believe has value, which is, you know, very close where we're, we're touching the definition of what money is and why, why people care about money is what matters. So if if I were to invent a stable coin that I like swear it's pegged to the dollar and maybe there are reserves for it and so on, that's fine. Um, I can create this like closed ecosystem, this closed economy where people can transact in quote unquote dollars. But as long as people can't cash those out and actually get product or, or get access to Colombian peso or to Bolivars or to dollars in Zelle or dollars in PayPal or I mean, you need ramps like the, the, the ramps and, and the, the convertibility of the money is the most important thing. And this is why Bitcoin is one of the most impactful uh, phenomenon in Venezuela today because Bitcoin, ha through its uh, development and, and since, since it's one of the since it is the the most uh, the, the oldest cryptocurrency and there there has been this great product uh, local Bitcoins that has been operating in Venezuela for quite a while. There is this liquid market between Bolivars and Bitcoin, and that allows people to transact almost as if they were using the dollar, right? It, it, like if, if you want to if you want to get access to the dollar and you don't have a US account, if you can get access to local Bitcoins and it only takes a few like, keystrokes and, and you know, like obviously some, you need some technical sophistication, you need to be interested in Bitcoin in the first place. But if you have all of this, like you, all these things you can learn on the internet. And this is why we see people that are mostly younger, mostly, uh, you know, more tech savvy that are interested in this. But there is a vehicle today uh, technically that exists that can give you exposure to a currency that doesn't depreciate even though bitcoin may be very volatile it certainly is a better currency than the bolivar and the important thing about bitcoin in this context as well i just want to emphasize is that liquidity aspect of it it's the fact that it's globally liquid it's global in nature right and so you can use it as this back end kind of conduit currency to get from one to the other without necessarily having to be banked in all of these multiple hops that you're trying to go through. Um, 
And we saw this. We did a study with a money changer, actually, who at the time was using cash in suitcases in order to manage his liquidity, manage his float between the different banking silos that that he was hopping between. So he would bring cash you know, from Miami back to Columbia in a suitcase. Um, and we were like, you know, why don't you try using Bitcoin? We challenged him with this. And there were some hurdles, there were some problems, but the thing that we found was that it could serve as something of an escape hatch for him in moments of illiquidity or sort of market displacement. Bitcoin was the global, globally liquid currency. And so it's less about Bitcoin being perfectly decentralized or perfectly censorship resistant, because very often the sites and services that people are using around it, they're not perfectly decentralized. They're not censorship resistant, but it's globally liquid. So it's interesting when you talk about all the different currencies people are using, the bolivar, the peso, the dollar, the different versions of the dollar, and also some crypto. It's kind of that barter economy that maximalists have a massive issue with with cryptocurrencies. So you're you're seeing in a, a real world example of how multiple currencies are a problem. Yeah, so it, absolutely. Um, I, it's not the first time I've thought about this sort of parallel of like, oh, this is a little bit like all of the shit coins yeah, out there that we're all going to have to be like awning, awning and offing between. Um, that Melton you know, was thrown at everyone this yeah, morning. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> oh, my God. Um, but, you know, I think that the lesson is, is like, it does kind of work. You can make it work. But is it optimal? Probably not. And in in this scenario, one of the big insights, again, that we've taken away from it with is that people are going to find these shelling points, another favorite crypto word, right? Shelling point. Um, but people are going to find these shelling points, these sort of points of aggregation, which in Venezuela tend to be uh, the Bolivar still. That is still the primary medium of exchange. Um, the U.S. dollar is sort of the thing that everyone wants, in particular U.S. dollars cash or U.S. dollars uh, through access to a U.S. bank account. And then to a much lesser extent, to a much less pervasive extent, um, but I think to in many ways a no less meaningful extent, Bitcoin, I think has the possibility of becoming yet another one of these shelling points because of its globally liquid nature. So it's very cool that you've, and very interesting that you've kind of come to this Bitcoin conclusion, because obviously I've seen in the various times I've been researching this, say for interviews with Alejandro, I've seen Dash is doing a lot of work there. I've noticed EOS is doing some work there. I've noticed people are promoting different cryptocurrencies and stable coins. But actually, is that a problem having too many? Is it confusing? I would say the Petro is confusing to people. So the Petro, just for context, is this quote unquote cryptocurrency uh, token, what have you that the Venezuelan government issued about a year and a half ago. And now everyone in Venezuela is aware of the Petro. They're aware of it as a, again, quote unquote, cryptocurrency. And if you speak to the average person, you ask them, what do you think of cryptocurrency? They're going to say, oh, it's all a scam. And my response to that is like, I don't totally disagree with you, um, but why do you say that? And then their response is, oh, the Petro. Um, And so that's caused quite a lot of confusion because they'll think of that even before they're thinking of Bitcoin. Um, And, you know, I would say that that's the thing that stood out the most. Many, many people have heard of Dash as well. Uh, We didn't happen to speak to many who'd used it um, or any who'd used it, actually. But, you know, we're a small sample size. We're not looking for statistical significance. Yeah, no, and we're aware of... uh projects that are interesting that are using Dash. There's a, there's a group that uh, has a, this protocol, Dash Text. They are pushing the idea of paying for things using SMS uh, with Dash, which you know carries a lot of risk because the keys are being handled by someone else and, and not you. You, you need, like, if, you, if you want to be able to handle your own keys, you need a smartphone. You can't use the, the SMS protocol. But um, and like this also is very, uh, very prone to be censored or, or taken over because the government obviously has uh, influence, influence would be putting it mildly uh, with the tel- telcos, like they could stop messages, they could steal your money potentially if they if they wanted to. So there are some projects that, you know, they they are trying to do some work and, and uh, I commend the work, some of the work that that's being done. Uh, they're trying to 
kind of undo the bad perception of cryptocurrency by the petrol, which would may turn out to be a good thing. They have signed up some merchants. Uh, they they are known for exaggerating their claims a little, uh, and uh, not super excited about that contributing to the confusion. But um, I think there are some efforts being led there, and and you know the, the EOS. I'm not I'm not super aware. I know that Give Crypto did some work uh, with them, but we don't know enough about it. But yeah, we in general, I think it's it's good to to try out things, but not so good to exaggerate the claims. What is the access to technology like in Venezuela? Um, you know, because we're talking about people who are desperately poor, but do they still manage to have access to mobile phones? And yeah, so we're talking about. I think Jill put it very well uh, when we actually. This is when we met when we presented at, at IDEO. We had this like slide that said Venezuela is stuck in 2014. So in many ways, people, the last year where they had access to a salary that could pay for a phone was around 2014, 2015. So the people who got phones there, uh, which is not an insignificant amount, still have them. And if, if it's still, if it's a phone that's long lasting, you know, like some phones are obviously better than others. Like that, we know like there's a lot of Motorola, there's a lot of Samsungs. Um, there are about four, four and a half million phones that have Android 4 and Android 5 versions. So we're talking about very old Android versions. If you were to force to use a, a cell phone you like the, of the, this models, you, you would think it's terribly slow. But, you know, it runs WhatsApp. It runs a basic browser. And uh, there is, it's not impossible that a version of RTM or a version of local Bitcoins could run on these things. And if you allow people to transact with each other securely i think you would be empowering a lot of the people who don't like who don't have access today you would be doing a great service to to the economy and to and to the people and potentially you'd be helping to save lives uh the numbers are tricky and you know like phones get stolen phones get re- like they, they can't get replaced often because i mean uh, in, in india for example you can get a new phone for 50 dollars and you can run a decent version of android in venezuela since there are import controls, uh, pe- like pe- like it's very difficult to do business there. There's a lot of corruption. It's significantly higher. So you, if you want to get a decent phone, maybe it runs f- like for about 100 and 150 dollars. And there's a lot of Chinese models that are questionable. And like you know, there are, there are a lot of uh, nuance. Uh, like there, there are a lot of points that make it difficult for people to access phones. But talking like just today, it is worth the effort to to tailor. Uh, to really old phones so that millions of people will have access to products that they don't have today. And like like I said, like if if you if you can run WhatsApp on a phone, you could definitely program something that allows people to use money. There's there's no excuse to not do it. Like it's just obviously it takes longer. It's it's more technically involved. You have to hire engineers that are more like that are willing to spend the extra effort in t- targeting these old, old platforms, but we're talking about millions of people here. That are, would still have have uh, we, we they would reap the benefits of of the people focusing on them on their devices. Yeah, it's it's worth mentioning. Venezuela is just a land of contradictions, um, and you know we we talk about how yeah people actually have pretty good access to internet. Electricity is practically free. It's subsidized by the government. It's the one thing that you can get. And then in the same breath, we're talking about power outages and internet outages. And the reality is it's it's sort of Schrodinger's state. It's all of these things existing simultaneously where there is free electricity when it's on, but the uh, the infrastructure is degrading, it's degrading fast, and so it's becoming spottier and spottier. It is a deeply impoverished country where one in three people has an Android, right? And there's actually better access in many ways to banking. There's for sure better access to online banking than exists in the United States. Now, why? It's because the system is so broken that you have to have access to online banking. If you don't, then you can't go out and buy goods and services. And I, I think that's exactly right, that it is basically just frozen in time. In 20, If you think of Cuba and how Cuba we think of as sort of frozen in time in the 1950s, Venezuela is frozen in time in 2014. How, how long are the power outages? How long can they last for? Well, the, we had a really big one that lasted for about four days. Uh, that was like nationwide. That was really terrible. Uh, but usually, does that then also then 
take out that takes out the phones because you can't charge your phone. Yes, exactly. So and and it also the substations that uh, the cell towers they also have batteries, massive batteries. But when they run out, they run out, and they, you don't have coverage. So we're talking about if if there are like massive events like these this, this particular blackout that's like in the beginning of March. Uh, people were disconnected for a while. Like people couldn't talk to their families. They were very. It was a moment of big tension. I was very worried. Uh, but usually, you know, at least for now, the normal situation is that a blackout would last four hours, five hours. So it's manageable because you can still, you know, manageable. Like I say, with like a position of absolute privilege here, because like I I can't imagine having to endure that every day, like a blackout that's. Not only five hours long, but also unexpected, right? So um, it's still we're still at a point where people can have access to charging phones occasionally and sending messages occasionally, and that is still appealing for for like to to, to design for and and to to cater for. We're not talking about a situation like Cuba where no one has access to internet. Like in Cuba, it's very, very difficult to have access to a phone or to have access to internet. It's terribly expensive. And this is by design. Like the government wants it that way. And I'm sure the Venezuelan government would want it that way too. But they also are very used to using WhatsApp and they're used to using these these, these services. So um, yeah, blackouts, and they're also very regional. So like uh, the city of Maracaibo uh, in, the west, in the west of Venezuela is like faced with constant blackouts and like people it's very hot people can't sleep at night so like they have to like sleep in the rooftops like it's it's terrible for some people but uh it, it's something that you can you, like i just want to emphasize that i don't want this like uh terrible situation to trap us into a, a cycle of inaction right like, oh no it's too late to do something for venezuela i think it it, it is not are mobile phones a requirement, though, to be able to deliver some kind of solution and help to the people? Um, so I work with technology, right? Like I, my, my background is, is technology and, and design. And I, I think that the smartphone is one of the most powerful tools ever invented. And the ability to just have a computation in your pocket just grants you so many magical powers. You can talk to like it's telepathy, basically. Like you can talk to people that are very far away, and uh, I like I obviously always take inspiration on WhatsApp and, and what they've done and this ability to to talk with uh, with people that are in your network or like even like Facebook groups. Um, so there's no reason why we couldn't expand that uh, into the realm of digital money. But we we need to cater to to this, like the very specific design principles that that we have uncovered, like the the, the, the situations that people are are going through, and um, I, I do think that without like if you take that away, like if you uninvent the smartphone or like you, if you I just if we if it gets to a point where people don't have phones anymore, there may be some products that you could you could designed for uh like for example in africa there's m-pesa right in 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 kenya this is very very common uh and people don't usually have smartphones they have regular phones but there you have the collaboration of the government and the telco companies right and if you have to face a hostile actor that can potentially take over people's funds like i was just mentioning dash text as an example of this right then it is much preferable to be able to count on a network that where you can hide, right? Like, and the internet is that network. You can you can encrypt the packages, right? Like, if you use HTTPS and if you use certain kind of connections, you can uh, you you are uh, hidden from from like from plain view. Like, if if you use WhatsApp, for example, the government can't know that you are sending messages uh, to potentially provoke an uprising, right? And this is a political realm. And in the economic uh, realm, if you're sending money from one place to another, the government can't track that or, or, they, they, or potentially couldn't track that if you use something like Zcash, for example, or if you use something that, you know, like maybe even Bitcoin, I don't think the government today has the resources to to get into every individual case and to hire uh, like chain analysis and, and these things to like really crack down on it. First, because it's it's too small for them to really care right now. And second, many maybe some of them are using it to to move money around as well. So uh, we have to rely on, like we have to capitalize on the fact that the government is using many of these systems, like for communication, for uh, many things, and and the fact that they are trapped using them means that we can empower the common person to be able to use these same systems 
for their personal empowerment. Okay, before we start going into the kind of conclusions and the next steps for you, uh, just like how much other research have you done to other countries where, and are you, is the work you're doing now in consideration where this could be rolled out to other places and other countries where people have a need, or are you just entirely focused on Venezuela now? So, so for this project, we were entirely focused on Venezuela, but often you find inspiration in other places that's applicable in, you know, the places you didn't originally re research. So um, certainly if we were to do research in Zimbabwe, um, you know, the research would overlap. Um, but for this project, it was entirely focused on Venezuela. Okay. I think we all share a vision, though, as well, of at some point, probably not in the immediate future, but at some point going to other geographies. Um, you know, something that I've thought a lot about is that there's this whole spectrum out there, right? You have places like Argentina that are experiencing high inflation on the order of 40%, um, but, you know, nowhere near the types of controls or policies or what have you in Venezuela. And then you have sort of even more extreme scenarios in many ways, places like Cuba or Iran, um, and so you can start to map this sort of spectrum. And of course, there's so many other things that go into it around sort of culture and history and so on. Um, but, it, you know, that's something I'm really interested in exploring. I think we all are mm -hmm. over the course of the long term. Okay, so what were the design conclusions you came to? Can you distill that into a, like, is it is it a number like a five design principles you've come to? Or is it a framework? How, how did you conclude the work? Yeah, so... Uh, we've, we've come at it from a number of different angles, and we'll be sharing a lot of this content over the next few weeks. Um, but I'll speak first to just some of the design principles. Um, so we want systems, we want to be able to build systems that are going to be resilient. And we mean that both very literally in the sense of resilient in the face of low bandwidth situations, internet outages, power outages, um, but also then systems that will be able to adapt with people as the situation continues to develop and change, not just in terms of infrastructure, but just in terms of the problems that they're facing. Um, we also wanna build systems that are going to instill confidence in people. So I think in cryptocurrency, we get very obsessed with this notion of creating this perfectly trustless system, right? Of replacing trust, eliminating it, minimizing trust. But in many ways, what we found was that there are still trust systems that are working today in Venezuela. Often, again, it's amongst sort of family units or friends or extended networks, digital networks. Um, but as we start to extend the trust further and further out, it becomes harder and harder to be confident in your counterparty, in um, you know whatever whatever it is that you're doing, whoever it is you're relying on. And so the question I would ask and challenge people in this industry to ask is how can we instead of trying to eliminate trust actually elevate the trust uh, in these systems and then the final thing I mentioned earlier about the sort of silos that we encountered um, how can we create systems that are more open how can we create systems that enable people if you don't immediately have access to another silo how can we either open up a tunnel between those two silos or use sort of multiple hops of individuals, again, elevating that trust between them in order to get from one silo to another. So those are kind of three of the broad themes that we've walked away with is the resilience uh, needed in these systems uh, that we want to elevate the sort of confidence that people have um, in these systems and in each other. And then also how can we open up these systems between each other? And is this going to be delivered as a combination of product and education? And what's the kind of mix? For, for now, it's education. For now, it's just the research. Um, we are certainly working with some of our sponsors, some of our partners. I want to mention we are a completely neutral organization. That was part of the reason for making this be a nonprofit. We definitely did not want to be the people going in and shilling our product uh, based on this absolute human tragedy. But we are working with some organizations uh, within the crypto space and also you know, open to working with organizations outside of the crypto space on how they can steer their own product directions and their own business strategies to be in real service 
uh, to people on the ground there. So that's that's sort of the immediate steps. I'll say it, the outpouring of support um, just from the crypto community, from the world in general, has been incredible as we've started to share some of the insights that we've gathered and some of the research that we've done. And so I think one of the big challenges for us over the next couple of weeks is figuring out how we can open up this platform so that it's a two-way street, right, of not only just us sharing the research, but also then uh, starting to collaborate and, and um you know, just open it up as as something that anyone can contribute to. So stay tuned for for what we come up with on that. So are you not directly looking to build products? Are you more wanting to encourage other people with your research to build products and solutions within Venezuela? So one of the things that we have found is that it takes tremendous effort to you know, cater to to people uh, to like build liquidity, especially right. Like this is something that is a massive undertaking. Like if you if you need a product that uh, people will actually use, you need to have the resources. Like and the in some cases even the peer to peer network of people who are already trading. Like if you want to have impact today in Venezuela, like you need to have an existing platform. So examples of those existing platforms today are RTM, uh, local bitcoins. And uh, not a lot more. Like, well, there's there's obviously people doing hawalas, right? Like the, the people who are sending money, uh, they are like their networks of money changers in Colombia and Venezuela. So we could potentially work with, you know, the people who are already like have the network set up. Uh, and uh, we we don't have a, a product that we want to like promote or or to to shape today. But certainly we're open to working with organizations like local bitcoins and like RTM and, you know, like if if there are like like consortia of money changers that also want to explore the use of cryptocurrency or want to just design a product that may not have to do anything with cryptocurrency, but they want to open up the access and maybe start sending money in pesos or in dollars to Venezuela, that would alleviate the situation of like having to find bolivars here and there and, and the hot potato and so on. We'd be really open to, to all of that. So... Where, where we're at this point is we are sharing research and uh, very soon we hope to be working on more product direction. Uh, but yeah, stay tuned for that. Okay. And just to reiterate, you've obviously mentioned Bitcoin a lot and you keep talking about Bitcoin. So despite, you know, we talked about earlier, Jill, everyone getting overexcited, you do see Bitcoin playing a very important role in helping people. Yeah, I think for me, um, you know, a lot of this research, actually, to be honest, grew out of a bit of an existential crisis that I had around a year ago, <laughs> where I was looking around, I was standing there at consensus, and I was looking around, and I was like, oh my god, what is going on here? What is this all about? Is there even anything real here? I'd been working at that point for four and a half years in this industry in various capacities, and I was just like, this is not, this is not why I got into this. Um, and for me, a lot of this, this research that we've done and what a lot of this project has been about is me just asking that question, like, is there a there there? Is there something here? And for me, I'm walking away from it saying, yes, I don't think it's necessarily what people think it is. It's certainly not a panacea. Um, but is Bitcoin helping at least a small subset of people? And yes, specifically today, I think it is Bitcoin. Um, yeah, it absolutely is. Uh, now, does that mean that, you know, crypto solutions are the right way to go to, to solve all of these different problems? Absolutely not. Obviously, right. You know, cryptocurrency is not going to solve shortages of soap and tampons in Venezuela. But I do think that there is something there. And that's an area that I'm very interested in continuing to explore. I'm grateful to work in an industry that's interested in exploring that. Um, but, you know, well beyond that, I just hope that our research can inspire products and services, whether they're leveraging Bitcoin or DAI or Dash or whatever it is, or whether they're just using run-of-the-mill centralized technologies, whether they're running on things like WhatsApp. So what are the most important things that you would like to see start happening now? You're obviously going to get out, get out there. You presented yesterday. I expect you're going to be doing a lot of presentations now. What are the actions you want to see happening? Well, we just want people to focus more on on Venezuela and on a more informed way. So like that, if, if our research uh, is useful to companies and institutions and 
we we would really like that. We would really like uh, our voice and like the voice of Venezuelans and then the situation that they're living to be more fully understood by the people who are designing the protocols and designing the products because oftentimes there is a mismatch between what they believe should happen and what actually is is happening on the ground and uh, that mismatch doesn't let them see or doesn't let them shape product in a way that is very useful for people so like we have all these great ideas about making trustless this trustless that this kind of like oh let's make a new government let's make a new DAO, and like those are really fun ideas that they could be really cool experiments and i'm, I'm all for that but um if you want to have an impact today i think it, it's worth taking the time to understand what's going on and uh and to really cater to what people are are actually living through and, and i i often you know people are often like um they'll, they'll hear stories about venezuelans or we'll come back and tell people stories and like and, and the response we'll sometimes get is oh they should just use bitcoin and to me hearing that is just as obtuse as seeing a woman in burkina faso carrying water on her head for 20 miles and saying why why wouldn't you take an uber why wouldn't you take an Uber? Why are you going to walk all that, you know, all that distance? And I think bringing this research is sort of like setting the context for products, right? Products aren't just singular, discrete things that just work on their own. They're part of a broader system of people, of culture, of narratives, of emotions, of networks, right? And so when people are like, oh, just use Bitcoin. If you, if you were to give Bitcoin to someone in Venezuela, all you've succeeded in doing so far is giving someone Bitcoin. You haven't changed their outcome. And so even, even the nugget around, well, actually, people still have to use the boulevard. That means your design is going to be very different because you now you're designing for convertibility. You're designing because people need the boulevard to be able to transact, which is different than just saying, use Bitcoin, right? Oh, like, here's a wallet, here's some Bitcoin. That doesn't change the outcome. So I think having that systemic knowledge of the context is super important if you're really truly interested in changing outcomes, right? And so a, a lot of our research, we kind of see it as influencing um, perception of Bitcoin, how it can be used, what it's for. To the people within, within the industry and the people outside the industry, um, changing product, so shaping people's um, uh, point of view on what's worth building and for who. Um, and hopefully influencing policy around these things. You know, these are tools that are very important for survival for some people in the world. Wow. Okay. So, so what's coming up now? What's going to what's going to be happening for you guys over the next kind of this week? Obviously, you're going to be at consensus, but week, month, few months. What's coming up? Yeah. So we'll be speaking at consensus later today. Um, I was lucky to be able to present at Magical Crypto yesterday. We'll also be going to the Oslo Freedom Forum, which is put on by the Human Rights Foundation later this month. Alejandro will be speaking there. Um, so a lot of the very short term stuff is just around sharing this. And then longer term, as we mentioned, it's about collaborating with individuals, entrepreneurs, organizations to, uh, to, to serve those goals that Jamal just mentioned. OK, and people listen to this. Like, what can they do? How can people help? What kind of actions do you want to see? So I want to thank you, Peter, because you actually and your podcast played a pivotal role in all of this because I recorded with you almost exactly a year ago last May when I was kind of in the throes of this existential crisis I mentioned. When we got stuck in an elevator. We did. Yeah, we got stuck in an elevator. It was in Mayfair, though. So, you yeah. know, it was, <laughs> there were worse places to be stuck. But it was, I believe, shortly thereafter you recorded with Alejandro. And so we listened to each other's podcasts and we were like, oh, wow, we have really similar interests. Like, let's chat, let's collaborate. And that was a huge part of how he and I connected initially. And then, of course, we walked into IDEO and dragged Jamal down the rabbit hole with us. And um, yeah, so credit to you. Thank you. Yeah, thanks Thanks for being a great platform. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you. Great connector. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah, so follow along. Um, check out our website, uh, openmoneyinitiative.org. Um, you can follow us on Twitter as well, at makeopenmoney. Um, and stay tuned because we'll be coming out with some various ways that, you know, you can all start to participate and contribute and, you know, it's, it's going to take a village. It's going to take an industry, right. To, to make a dent in any of these things, but really looking forward to sharing more soon. 
Brilliant. Well, listen, look, it's been worth the wait. Thank you so much for coming on again. I think it's super interesting. I've learned a lot from this. Actually, one of the things I've learned most from, actually probably from you, Jill, when you've purposely on Twitter quite tried to temper people's excitement about something, I've kind of felt myself going down that route, like the excitement of seeing real world Bitcoin usage, not because I want it to go up so I can be rich, but I think tempering that helps route, though. <laughs> no, but yeah, it does. But tempering that has been, I think it's been really useful because sometimes we see some really idiotic remarks on Twitter about uh, Bitcoin and Venezuela. I think that's been super helpful. So look, thank you all for coming on. And thank you, Peter. Anything I can ever do to help, let me know. Thanks, Peter. Okay, so how was that? What did you make of that? Have you listened to any of my other previous shows covering Venezuela? They're really good. They're really useful, actually. Uh, I've definitely benefited from having Alejandro in my life. I'll probably call him a friend now. Uh, we speak quite regularly. He's very useful uh, explaining to me the reality of what's going on in Venezuela. And talking to the team about this, the reality on the ground and how people use money, it was really interesting. And, you know, it's obviously really sad and really quite desperate what's happening there but understanding the reality of the different types of money and how people use it and what they have to use was really interesting i hadn't heard some of this before i also caught part of jill's talk at the magical crypto conference where she was discussing their research i hope that presentation is made available at some point if it is i'll share it out but some of the realities of facing mass poverty you know the strange situation where people are find it difficult to find food yet the restaurants are full something i would never have thought of or or didn't know about and the lack of basics you know the lack of access to toilet paper or for uh, women to get access to hygiene products this is really desperate and i really commend them for doing their work and doing the research and and presenting this out for us to learn about it did also help me temper my thoughts about bitcoin in the country Obviously, it can help a limited number of people, but the crumbling infrastructure and the lack of education or confusion with Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies is real. So I think it was very interesting at the start where Jill said about she comes in it for two directions. Those who are enthusiastic, she tries to temper them, but those who are unaware, she tries to bring them in. So I guess there's a balance there. Anyway, look, I really appreciate the team coming on. I welcome them on whenever they want. If they've got any new information to present in the future, the show is always uh, an open place for them. People always tell me I give platforms to people. I don't. I offer interviews. But they are more than welcome to use this as a platform for their initiative whenever they want. Please do check out the show notes. There's plenty of information there available if you want to find out more. And yeah, I definitely look forward to hearing some feedback on this. And listen, if you want to support the show, there's a whole bunch of things you can do. Whether you leave me a review on iTunes, become a patron, or want to become a sponsor. Well, becoming a sponsor is difficult. I've only got one slot left this year. But still, if you're interested in that, feel free to reach out to me. Everything's available on my website. Just head over to whatbitcoindid.com. Click on the support section. Anything you do to support the show is really appreciated. So thank you, thank you, thank you. Anyway, lots more interviews in the bag. I'm going to have two more coming out this week because I've got a backlog to get through. So... Probably on Thursday, I've got my interview with Travis Kling coming out discussing the markets and recent price movements. And on Friday, I've got a follow-up interview with Andrew Polstra discussing Schnorr, Taproot, and other new tech coming to Bitcoin. If you heard my first interview with him, you, uh, you'll definitely enjoy this. And yeah, if you want to reach out to me, my email address is hello at whatbitcoindid.com and I look forward to hearing from you.